defined by their race, and they're defined by their religion, and they're defined by their geographic region. And just because you put somebody in the L box, that's not all they are, right? And so one of the things that I've really tried to do in this book, which has been a remarkable journey over the last six months, was to really tell the stories of three generations of gay men from who came out in the late 1950s to like the last decade, giving voice to this idea that there are different ways of coming out, that it's not so easy nowadays as some might have us believe, and that made it some ways harder, and that the psychological process is pretty consistent across time and across generations. And while, you know, we have will and grace, and that makes everything so much better, <laughs> right? The fact of the matter is that it is very, very, very difficult for some young people to negotiate their sexual identity. When I was asked a few months ago to write up a piece for the Bay Area Reporter about why I wrote this book, I tell a story. And the story I tell is a story about my mother's passing in 2014. She passed suddenly in her bed one day. And like any good Greek son, you know, raised by Greek immigrant parents, I did all the things you were supposed to do, the traditional things, the church service, and the 40-day memorial, and all of those things that she would have wanted to happen. I did. On the 40-day memorial at the church, where I was surrounded by my family and my friends who are remarkable, the priest, who was somebody I grew up with, who for all intents and purposes be known as Ernie, <laughs> decided it was appropriate at that moment, with me and my husband standing in the audience, to proceed to tell us that the law of God is not the same as the law of man, and that basically, this whole marriage equality thing is garbage. Now, you could have taken a knife to my heart. This was a hard enough day already, and he just made it a lot worse. Of course, everybody was shocked, and my family was amazing afterwards, and they rallied around us. The beautiful part about that, though, was a week later, my cousin's son came to our house, sat down, and told my husband and me that he was a gay man. Right, and we told him, of course, his like membership card and his other materials were in the other room waiting for him. <laughs> I proceeded to give him like the required public health, you know, lecture about the vaccinations and all those things that you're supposed to do. Um, I think I referred to him as your gay shots you need to go get. But what was really remarkable was that this young man, upper middle class family from New York City, grew up in a family where I was part of it, where no one ever had an issue where everybody was always very loving. My mother's biggest concern about my wedding was, did I really want to get married? <laughs> Not that I was marrying a man, right? Um, was struggling. And I thought, if he's having a hard time, he who on paper should be having an easy time, what is, it, what is the reality for other people who don't have this privileged existence? And that led me to write this book. So we also know, here's a case study in, 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 in from Hawaii, you know, just giving some more indications of, of, of phenomena that are going on there. And also the realities for people, for example, only 51% of transgender youth usually sleep at their parent or guardian's home compared to 94% of cisgender youth. Telling us right away that the health of this population is driven in large part by discrimination and rejection faced by individuals who identify in this way. So, for a long time, I've been really angry at this term MSM, right? And I know that the CDC needed to adopt this term in the early 1990s as a way of classifying AIDS transmission cases. But I am a gay man, um, and while I have sex with men, I don't go around identifying myself as an, an MSM, right? And in fact, if you look at paper after paper after paper on uh, sexual behavior and on HIV and other pathogens, what you find is that most of us have identified. <laughs> yes, Jesus. <laughs> that most MSM identify as, and my mother, right? Uh, identify as, as gay or bisexual. And why I raise this is because I think these behavioral terms really fail to acknowledge the role that sexual identity plays in health. And that if we're really going to really shape the health of the population, we have to pay attention to identity. Right? And we know that sexual orientation, often used uh, synonymously with sexual identity, consists of not only behavior, but attraction and an identity. Right? So one of the big jokes, ha ha ha, is when I tell people, we're like, you know, like I'm Greek and my family's Greek, and they're like, well, your people invented gay. 
And I'm like, oh, my people didn't invent gay. My people were like, in Athens, you know. And I'm like, no, these were men who were married to women who would have sex with young boys, and that's a whole other story, in the evenings, right? And when they would leave their wives, and that was more about misogyny than anything else, quite frankly. But in fact, this idea of identity is really critically important, more so probably than behavior in thinking about the health of the population. So MS, MSM and WSW, as my, as my friend Elon Meyer would say, often imply a lack of lesbian or gay identity and an absence of community, networks and relationships in which same gender pairings mean more than merely sexual behavior. Overuse of the terms MSM and WSW adds to a history of scientific labeling of sexual minorities that reflects and inadvertently advances heterosexist notions. And I believe that to be incredibly true, incredibly powerful. We also know that sex and gender identity are not the same things. Sex, a binary label, often defined as male or female, assigned by a doctor or some other <coughs> person at birth, usually based on somebody's genitals. And gender identity, as we all know, the innermost concept of oneself is male, female, or a blend of both. Right? And we know that one's gender identity can be the same or different from their sex assigned at birth. So there are a million terms that we can go all over here, but gender expression, transgender, gender transition are some of those issues that we think about. Um, and of course, we should be always using effective pronouns, even those of us who are old and have trouble using the word they in our, par in our papers should be using the, the pronoun they in our papers. Um, finally, uh, and as I wrap up this section, I wanted to say that coming out or identity disclosure, one of the really interesting things about the book was this notion that every single man talked about that you come out your whole life. You don't come out only once, right? And so I ask any heterosexual person to imagine what that would feel like, in that every situation you had to go to, you had to come out as gay or lesbian or trans. What would that feel like to you? And that is a burden and a reality that LGBT people live every single time, every, every single day of their lives. Shockingly, I had to relive it when I went to Rutgers. Because I'm like, did you not just go on the Googles? Because you really could tell everything you wanted to know about me from the Googles. But I had to keep, <laughs> I had to keep coming out as a gay man. Fortunately, at 54 or 55 years old, whatever I was at the time, I had the tools to be able to manage that. But it was very reminiscent to me of those really difficult conversations that I had as a young man when I had to continually out myself. So finally, last but not least, queer, a term that has become increasingly popular an umbrella term encompassing a lot of people uh, is not specific to sexual orientation or gender. All right. So as we think about the work that we're doing as clinicians, as researchers, you know, as practitioners, it is incredibly important that we think about being inclusive in everything that we do that captures individuals' sexual and gender identity as much as possible. This is an example of an intake form that's used by one organization that is really an attempt to move, move the conversation in that direction. The work that I've done over the course of the last 25 years is really rooted in this idea of a biopsychosocial perspective where every phenomenon that I study, I believe, is some combination of biological, psychological, and social drivers. And I will tell you that I strongly and truly believe that as much as HIV is a virally produced phenomenon, it is a socially produced phenomenon. It is a socially produced phenomenon because if you were to look at the epidemic in the United States, if it were purely virally produced, then a probabilistic model would argue that everybody would have an equal chance of living with HIV, and that's hardly the case in the United States, as we know. That most marginalized populations, people of color and gay men, are most inadvertently affected. And the other belief I bring to the table is the belief that, that to understand health, you have to understand from a syndemic perspective, meaning that when there is one health problem, there are tend to be other health problems that those health problems are interlocking and mutually reinforcing. And more often than not, those health conditions are driven by biopsychosocial drivers. So when we, see, when we find populations that have structure, experience structural inequality, structural racism, structural homophobia, you know, microaggressions on a daily basis, uh, poverty, all sorts of discrimination, those populations, of course, experience worse health outcomes. People don't just, I've said this before, I'll say it again, people just don't wake up one morning and decide they're going to have a meth addiction, or type 2 diabetes, or be addicted to cigarettes, right? They don't. It's life circumstances that get them to that place. So while I'm very happy to focus on behavior change, I also think the other thing we need to do is focus on social and structural change and policy change. 
and I'm pretty much committed my rest of my career to like doing that. And so, as I've also said to another group earlier in the day, public health and politics go hand in hand. And that we, as public health people, have to advocate for laws and policies that enhance the well-being of populations. This is another model of this idea. So we know from 2011, when the Institute of Medicine published this report, that LGBTQ people face disparities at much higher rates, um, often because of minority stress. <coughs> While some research about the health of LGBT populations has been conducted, research still has a great deal to learn. And in eight years since this report, we may have incremental steps moving in that direction. Unfortunately, for LGBTQ people in the United States, things have been not so good in the last few years. Right? Uh, you will be glad to know that as I was, I was preparing to come to the auditorium, I got my little news flash on my, on, my, on my computer, which it automatically does. I'm not sure how. But it told me that a, a court had decided that it was illegal for doctors to deny abortions based on the conscience rule that Trump had to push forward. So I'm sure he'll fight that, and this will fight what keep going on. But the bottom line is that there have been efforts over the course of the last few years, certainly under this, under this administration, under this federal administration, to try to deny service to people who are non-heterosexual, you know, people who are you know, seeking abortion, just basically making it more and more difficult for those populations that are experiencing health disparities to get the services that they need. All right, health disparities. Here's a snapshot of some health issues faced by gay men, bisexual individuals, and, and lesbian individuals. What you will see is that there are some commonalities, but certainly there are specific areas that gay men experience, and let's just focus that gay men's health is not just HIV, as one would, as the literature would have us believe over the last 37 years, right? That lesbian health is not gay men's health, and that bisexual health is not gay men's or lesbian health. In fact, when we look at lesbian, and, lesbian gay men and women, um, what we see is that they have overall, overall, overall self-rated poor, less self-rated self overall health well-being, higher asthma diagnosis, more headaches, more allergies, more chronic diseases. There are a variety of different things that lesbians, gay men uh, experience across their lifespan. For transgender individuals, health challenges include um, cardiovascular disease, certain STIs, there's estimates that uh, trans women are, about 14% of trans women are infected with HIV, 3.2% of trans men, it's a, a paper that was recently published, high levels of depression and anxiety, substance and use, alcohol and tobacco and other drug use, injectable silicone problems, cancer that's associated with the biological gender, and hormone-related complications, including blood pressure, blood sugar, and clotting. And this is, the health issues are not just um, focused on physical health, but in fact, mental health. And if you look here, the blue bar shows LGB people, the orange bar heterosexual people, and you see a preponderance, a higher level of any psychiatric disorder among LGB people as compared to heterosexual people, more mood disorders, more anxiety disorders, more substance use disorders. Gay and bisexual men have a higher prevalence of depression, panic attacks, suicidal ideation, psychological distress, body image, and eating disorders. Lesbian and bisexual women have higher prevalence of depression, generalized anxiety disorder, psychological distress, and antidepressant use than their heterosexual peers. Uh, another another uh, graph here, this one from SAMHSA in 2016, and this is looking at substance use um, in the past year, and you can see pretty consistently across age ranges, the first three bars, the first three uh, le levels, and then across gender, pretty consistently, sexual minority in individuals report more substance use in the last year than their heterosexual peers. Um, and then the same thing is same idea in the past month. And here, specifically, looking at disorders where illicit drug and alcohol use disorders almost double in sexual minority individuals, heterosexual individuals. And right here, the proportion of sexual minority adults and sexual majority adults who have received treatment in a substance use facility, about 11% of straight folks and about 15% of gay folks. And one more here, individuals with mental illness, the pattern's pretty consistent here, from everything I've shown you, 
again, across age and across uh, biological gender, higher rates of serious mental health illness in the past year. And here, too, one more time, severe impairment in the last year, sexual minority people, almost triple the amount of um, people with uh, these sick, with severe, uh, with here, regular impairment and severe impairments. Okay. So the summary of what I've just shown in these charts is that sexual minorities are more likely than their sexual majority counterparts to have alcohol, substance use, and mental health issues across biological sex and across age, more likely to use illicit drugs in the past year, to be current cigarette smokers, to be current alcohol drinkers, to have substance use disorders in the past year, and more likely to need substance use treatment. This, to me, does not occur in a vacuum. This, to me, is an indication of the social conditions that fuel these disparities in the population. Here's another chart this, uh, from the Health Fenway Institute that's looking at transgender mental health and substance use. And you can see here 62% reporting depression, 41% attempted suicide, 30% smoking daily, and 26% drugs and alcohol use. Among LGBT youth ages 12 to 24, high rates of smoking, high rates of homelessness, suicide attempts, and the risk of being bullied, threatened, or sexually coerced. And parental rejection has been consistently associated, and this is from the Caitlin Ryan paper of 2009, with higher rates of attempted suicide, drug use, depression, unprotected sex, and then homelessness and residential instability. So again, an example of how this microsystem or the, the family unit plays in perpetuating the health problems faced by the population. Here is, I think, a graphic that shows that shows it really, really, really well. Lifetime suicide attempts for highly rejected LGB, LGBT young people. And those with low rejection, much fewer suicide attempts. Those with high levels of rejection, much greater suicide. 5% of, uh, so of the general population um, are, uh, are, are, are generally population are homeless. 40% of those are transgender. So the reasons for homelessness among LGBTQ youth um, are runaway, they're, because they're runaways because of their familial rejection, they're forced out by their family, they've been physically, emotionally, or sexually abused at home, they've aged out of foster care, or they're financially, emotionally neglected from their family. So all of these, again, conditions that were produced in their lives. Case study, here again in Hawaii, found that nearly half of transgender youth felt hopeless in the past year, and half of transgender youth have attempted suicide in the past year. So again, this was first noted very, very significantly in this report in 2011, and there are efforts in Healthy People 2020 to try to address the issues faced by LGBT people. So here's a summary right there. So why does this happen? So I would argue that in addition to, it, and, and to the personal factors, including environment and poverty and geographic location and level of education, and enacted stigma. The structural factors are what are really driving the issues here, namely the structural stigma faced by LGBTQ people, the lack of knowledge and training faced by in, in the healthcare uh, industry, and health insurance or lack of access to health insurance. And I will tell you a story in that in this regard. I think the story is great. So my cousin through marriage was, we have a place on Fire Island, for those of you who know, Fire Island is a gay area of New, York, of New York, where there's a resort and people just hang out and have a good time and whatever. Like Provincetown, I mean, anybody? Okay, just whatever. <laughs> it's just fun. Okay, so it's like a beach place, and there's like a lot of partying and stuff. So Rory came over and he spent the week with us at our house and, you know, blah, blah, and he went out. Like any 20 something year old had a wonderful time. And then I woke up on Monday morning, had a short throat and went to his provider on Long Island, which is basically an extension of New York City, and the provider, and he said, my throat hurts really bad, and he said, the, 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 the provider said to him, you know, you probably have gonorrhea given your lifestyle. <laughs> and he did not have gonorrhea, in fact, he had strep throat. But this is the kind of aggression, right? Here's, this is in New York, right? A pretty blue state, right, that this is going on. So if this is going on in New York, you can only imagine what's going on in the rest of the country. Over the course of the last decade, I've had the great privilege of working on this study, um, and I'm going to show you some pieces of it, the P18 cohort study, which is a pr pr prospective cohort study 
looking at HIV risk, sexual behavior, and substance use in a sample of individuals um, in the New York metropolitan area. It was funded twice by NIDA. Um, it allowed us to have 14 waves of data collection. We were able to um, delineate risk and protected bases that predict the development of syndemics. And we were also looking at how syndemics vary by race, ethnicity, social class, and homelessness. But briefly, here's the design of the study. We started recruitment in 2009, it was in 2011. We screened about 2,000 people in order, via active and passive techniques. In order to be in our, in our study, you had to be male identified, by, actually biologically male, I'm correct, correcting myself, 18 years old or just 19, uh, self-reported HIV negative and sex with another man in the last year. This is a study of sexual minority men. 49% of those screened ineligible due to being eight, over the age limit of 19. The study sample was 600 individuals, 1% of whom ended up being HIV positive even though they thought they were HIV negative. The study sample came in over the course of seven waves of data collection where they did audio capacity assessment, calendar-based drug use and sexual behavior survey, pre-test counseling, HIV antibody testing, and post-test counseling. And we also did, in this first phase, in a P18B1, urine-based drug screening, which was not particularly useful because of the metabolism of drugs in the body. We should have done hair, but you know, we did it. Um, here's a sample we had at the baseline of the, of the study when we began. Very diverse in terms of race and ethnicity, not surprisingly given that they were 18 years old. Most of them enrolled in school. We used the measure of perceived socioeconomic status, which is actually shown to be a really good way to get SES indicators from those who are not, rather than as an acting, asking income, particularly for adolescents. Um, we used the Kinsey scale to measure sexual identity because, wow, Kinsey was kind of right. It is on the continuum. We forgot he was right in the 40s, wow. And then we're back to that again. Uh, interestingly, and this, by the way, changes over time, um, only 41% exclu identified exclusively gay, uh, homosexual, exclusively gay. That changes when you follow the men over this course of the study. So does gender identity, which is a, one of the remarkable things about this, this cohort study. Relationship status, very few in a relationship. Lifetime history of arrest, not surprising here, very disparate in terms of race and ethnicity, with young men of color more likely to be arrest, arrested. And then onset of sexual behavior at 16 years old um, in terms of anal and, uh, and sort of anal. Another person, Kristen and I, who Kristen just has disappeared, are doing an analysis right now from the data set. And there are very clear differences in terms of the onset of sexual behavior by race and ethnicity. All right, and so you, you could probably predict them. Um, and there's also the natural pattern that occurs in this population, which is oral sex followed eventually by anal sex. For Asian Pacific Islander guys are the last group to actually engage in those behaviors, with, with Latinx and white guys, uh, Latinx and black guys being the youngest to engage in those behaviors. One of the things we wanted to do in the study was actually the syndemic model for a very long time was tested through an additive model where people, where people sort of counted stressors. So if you were depressed or if you used drugs, if you were traumatized or your parents were abusive to you, added them together and created a combined score and were able to show that that combined score was predictive of engaging in, um, in condomless sexual behavior. So that was fine, but that just provides equal weighting to everything, right? We wanted to do something a little different here, and I'm a psychologist, so I love like construct models. I think they're really, really amazing. So I wanted to, to wanted to see if the indicators that we had here, the drugs, the, the mental health factors, the sexual behaviors, actually created these latent constructs and how, in fact, latent constructs are related to each other. And what we were able to show, pretty clearly, is that, in fact, there are three latent constructs, drug use, mental health, and unprotected sex, that, in fact, drug use and mental health load together on a second-order latent construct called mental health and drug use, and that's highly related with unprotected sexual behavior. We also looked at HIV incidents, and not surprising to you, you will see in this chart here that those who identify as black are much more likely to have seroconverted during the course of the study. Remember I told you at the beginning that six individuals were HIV positive of the 600? Okay, well then 43 more seroconverted over the course of the next six waves of data collection, uh, which is shown right here, right? And so 14 of those were black, 13 of those were Hispanic, only three of those were white, right? 
So, and, and we also showed a difference by perceived familial SES with only five of those in the high perceived familial SES is zero converting. So what does this mean to me? So it would be very easy for, in the wrong hand for somebody to look at this and say, well, then the black guys are just being riskier. Of course. They're just being irresponsible with their behavior, right? But in fact, when we look at this data, what we see is that of the black and Hispanic men, only uh, black and Hispanic men, only 15.9% report unprotected anal intercourse, as compared to 21% of the white men. Yet only three white men are converted as compared to 13 or 14, whatever it was, of the black men. So what's going on here? Um, what this story tells me and what we've been able to show since that time in another set of papers is that young men are selecting partners based on race. All right? So black men are selecting black partners. White men are selecting white partners. Black men are choosing partners from a population where there's less good viral suppression. They're not having more sex. They're not having more partners. They're selecting partners where the virus, from, from a population where the virus is unsuppressed. And so lo and behold, it's not surprising that if you choose from within a pool where there's unsuppressed viral load, where there's HIV floating around, you're more likely to get infected, even if you're engaging in behavior with your partners and less risky behaviors. It's just that you're more exposed to the pathogen. And that's what's happening. And it's really interesting when you look at the epidemiological data in New York City, Black and Hispanic men sort of level off at 27, 28, 29, and then there's a surge of white men in their 30s. When the, what I think what happened is that more uncontrolled virus appeared in the white population. But we don't ever talk about that, right? Also, what we were able to show, in fact, this is part of the story, when you look, not completely significant, but when you look at the certain conversions, you're seeing that 21 of the 43 were from neighborhoods where there's high HIV prevalence, right? So they're living in neighborhoods and probably sexing in neighborhoods where there's more HIV prevalence. So the likelihood of choosing a partner who is infected and unsuppressed is great. So probability theory would argue then that you are more likely to become HIV positive. Uh, this is my favorite slide. And not surprising also, when we looked at sexual risk behavior, there was more risk for those young men who are in a relationship. Mm -hmm. Duh, right? So this idea that, you know, there's no, you know what happens, right? I love you, you love me, we don't need a condom, everything's fine, we're going to be together forever. That usually happens within 24 hours, all that money. <laughs> the condom goes out the window, the minute emotions come into play, all rational thinking is out the window. I don't care how much self-efficacy you have, right? The emotions are playing here. In fact, five times higher odds for those to engage a, a risk for HIV, which means unprotected anal intercourse in this particular case, for those in a relationship. So to me, when we're having this whole PrEP discussion, we, and they're like, oh, you know, when I remember I would go to the CDC back 10 years ago, they'd be like, oh, we just we have to we have to put guys on prep when they're when they're high risk, and I'm like when 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 does that stop? Please tell me. They're like you know when they're like dating and stuff. I'm like no, actually they're high risk when they're in a relationship. And the majority of the infections, and Kristen will nod if I'm, if I'm presenting this incorrectly. Many of the infections that we found in our study, more often than not, the story was a guy that was in a relationship with somebody. And the big drama of the zero conversion was how he was going to tell that person, how that person, it was, there's a lot of trust issues that were going on. So, so being in a relationship, while lovely and wonderful, is also a risk behavior. Um, not surprising, as is the case with most emerging adults, over time, there's increase in drug use, not surprising at all. And then we got funded again. And this time, we had a sample of 650 people for P18V2. Again, audio CASI assessment, calendar-based drug use and sexual behavior survey, pre-test and post-test camping, and this time we added STIs. Specifically, we added uh, multi-site gonorrhea, multi-site chlamydia, and syphilis testing via plasma. 
we were able to retain 350 individuals from the first cohort. We added another 300 individuals from the second cohort. And as I said, gonorrhea, chlamydia, and syphilis testing were undertaken here. So the amazing team did all of that. And then we got a funding from the NIAID where we were able to actually add HSV testing and testing, genetic testing of HPV orally and anally. So we wanted to see individuals whether they were vaccinated against HPV and whether they were exposed to HPV. Uh, the word is paper. One of the papers that came out of this, of this second phase of the study was a paper that I did, a psychometric paper, where I was actually, I'd been going around for a very long time talking about the worries of a young generation of gay men, not being just about HIV, and I was able to show that psycho psychometrically, that in fact young gay men do worry about HIV, but they also have issues of concern about financial stability, social stability, self-esteem, loneliness, and physical appearance that in some time surpass their concerns about HIV. And if I were to show you a rank of the 40 worries, HIV was like around 17, right? Yet we think that it should be their number one, but it's in fact not their number one. Maybe it shouldn't be their number one, but it's definitely, and it's definitely not their number one. We also looked at PrEP use and drivers, uh, PrEP use and its drivers, and re what we found here was that, um, that non-use was often related to concerns about the long-term effects of the drugs, disbelief that the drugs actually um, could put on full protection, um, and, you know, and you know, the belief, false belief that if somebody becomes HIV positive, the medication would stop working. So we're not doing a very good job in educating around these issues. Okay, so let's talk about HPV now. These are the, this is what we use to assess HPV. Um, 52 types of HPV. Um, high risk type, and we categorized them as high risk, low risk types, both orally and anally. And then we looked at the vaccine preventable uh, um, types, and there are nine based on the Gardasil 9 uh, injection that is available now. We looked, this is data from three time points where the guys were about 24, 25, and 26 years old. We're still collecting data on this study. And here's the problem. The problem here is that here's this group of 24 year olds. Let's go back here, right? Uh, they're 24 years old at visit one. 19% are fully vaccinated. The, 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 the Gardasil became available in 2006. These guys were young children or teenagers as they were coming when this was available. Yet only 19% of them are fully vaccinated. This is a huge missed opportunity here for public health. Right? And here it is, no differences, however, interestingly, no differences by either race, ethnicity, or HIV status. And here's why they're not vaccinated. Financial, the cost was prohibited because I have insurance, but I was told I was going to have to pay something like $250 for the vaccination. That's not true. Um, I've gotten it because I personally don't really trust a lot of medicine, the mistrust issue, and the gender misinformation. The vaccine was just really marketed for young girls. Like, protect your daughter from cervical cancer, get the HPV vaccination. Who would be blamed for this? I like to say the CDC. Here's more gendered risk trauma. The virus only targets women. If it, even if a man got it, it wouldn't affect them. Oh, it's just like if you're gay, you're going to sleep with women? If you're, you're not, then you don't have to worry. And here's one more. I know that HPV increases certain types of cancer. It increases forms of cancer associated with the female reproductive system. What? Now, fortunately, as you all know, the CDC and other organizations have done a better job lately of marketing it to boys and men. I would like to actually add to that commercial, especially if you're a young boy is gay. But, okay, I'll take what we have, and hopefully we'll see a change as a result of that. Um, not surprising also is that when we looked at drivers of HPV infection, um, HIV status was highly associated with it. And what we found is that those who were, a, who were HIV positive in our study were also more likely to be exposed to carcinogenic strains. Of <laughs> Mom? <laughs> of HPV. Here's the problem. For HIV positive people, the clearance of HPV is much more difficult. And we know that there is consistently a growing number of HIV positive gay men or have developing oral and anal cancers. Right? Often preventable and treatable, 
but unfortunately, not so treatable if it's so late stage. And so part of the problem here is that many healthcare providers are not undertaking the appropriate screenings of their patients to determine whether or not they're exposed to HPV. So another missed opportunity for us. We also looked at intimate partner violence, a huge issue in our, in our population here, with uh, some 25% reporting both victimization and perpetration of IPV, um, often related to childhood mistreatment, impulsivity, PTSD, and gay-related stigma, high rates across time, differences by, by SES, race and ethnicity, I don't want to belabor these points, and the same thing with perpetration, highly related to uh, being in a relationship and being depressed, and lifetime IPV. Lifetime IPV, those who experienced mistreatment in childhood, and who had engaged in a, relation, in a relationship where there was IPV were more likely to experience IPV in their relationships now. So the cycle is there, and it's hard, and it's hard to break. So there are numerous healthcare challenges for working, for working with the population, right? Um, we know that the Human Rights Campaign uh, has documented that individuals who are LGB or trans experience discrimination in the healthcare providers. This is also true in the case study in Hawaii. Look at these numbers here, which I think are really problematic from Lambda Leader. They're about 10 years old, but still they're valid telling. The healthcare professionals refuse to touch me or use excessive precautions. 11% of LGBT people, 15% of transgender people, 36% of people living with HIV. Healthcare professionals use harsh or abusive language. 11% of LGBT people, 21% of transgender people, 12% of people living with HIV. So pretty consistently, extremely negative experience with healthcare providers. And when we looked at some concerns expressed by individuals for LGBTQ, you know, their concerns are um, they will be refused medical services, they will not be treated well, they don't have enough practical professionals adequately, are not prepared to deal with their issues, uh, there's, not, there's a community in fear and dislike of people. There's a pretty consistent patterns for LGBTQ people. And again, I come back to this idea that the administration is making it a lot more difficult for individuals to get care. So healthcare engagement on young, uh, we've also undertaken studies of healthcare engagement among young adult men. There have been numerous studies um, that have been published to date, but we um, have found, uh, studies have found um, in terms of accessing care, only about 27% of young gay men report accessing care, you know, infrequent visits, unmet healthcare needs, uh, often using STI facilities as, as a source for care, um, higher levels of dissatisfaction with health care services. This was our qualitative study that we did on health care delivery for young adults living, young men with HIV. And here's some, some quotes to illustrate some of the attitudes. This is a 23-year-old Hispanic man who said, the doctor wasn't knowledgeable with the LGBT community. She's never really had gay patients. So for her, it's kind of new. And her reaction was like, kind of like, you're young right now. You shouldn't be having anal sex. It wasn't the reaction I was expecting. Here's another one. He, the doctor, a Muslim. So his, his thing is, he didn't want to hear too much about sex with guys on guys. So it really makes it really uncomfortable to talk about it because all I'm going to get is marry a girl. It just comes up all the time because he knows I'm gay. Or this one. I've always gotten knowledge of gay men helping about risk and HIV and stuff through outside forces. I feel uncomfortable speaking to my doctor. All of these issues point to the structural problems that exist with healthcare delivery. Here's one more. I actually got an anal pap smear. The guy who runs the service organization was just telling some of the guys in this gay men's group about the services they offer, and I realized I don't think my doctor offers that. So not only are they getting discriminated against, but they're not getting the delivery of care that they need. Our quantitative study also found that racial and ethnic minority gay men were more likely to have one of more plus healthcare visits in emergency rooms. Young gay men of higher um, income were less likely to report a walk-in facility. Young gay men who experienced discrimination in the healthcare setting were less likely to prefer coordinated care. And disclosure of sexual orientation to the primary care provider reported that they're physically adequately addressed to healthcare needs. So when they felt comfortable disclosing their sexual orientation, they got the care that they need. So let me start summarizing the last few minutes after here for strategies for working with the LGBT population. I just kind of like this cartoon. <laughs> I don't know if it's appropriate or not, <laughs> but I think it's fun. Okay, fine. Um, when you're married 10 years like I am, come and talk to me. Okay. <laughs> so here's the thing. Ask yourself this. 
When you ask a clinician for primary care, will you ask to discuss your sexual history or your sexual health? You don't have to answer aloud. Have you ever been asked about your sexual orientation? Has a clinician ever asked if you have concerns about your gender identity? I bet most of you would answer no to those questions. Because the norm is heterosexual. That's the default. A survey of California physicians in 1980, 1982 found that close to 40% were sometimes or often uncomfortable providing care to gay patients. In 1999, 19% were sometimes or often uncomfortable providing care to gay patients. Still too much. A 2007 national survey of general public found that 30.4% would change their providers upon finding their provider was gay or lesbian. And that 35% would change practices if they found out the gay lesbian providers were fit. A study in 2005 and 2006 found that 50% of, of, of medical students, that 15% aware of the mistreatment of, 15% of people surveyed found that there was mistreatment of LGBT students at their schools, and 17% of LGBT students reported hostile environments. So, this study was just published in uh, 2015 in the American Journal of Public Health that found very clear implicit preferences for heterosexual people versus lesbian and gay people are pervasive among heter heterosexual healthcare providers. And there are a lot more health heterosexual healthcare providers than there are LGBTQ healthcare providers. Heterosexual nurses have the strongest implicit preference for heterosexual men over gay men. So how do we, do, how do we solve the problem? Well, we need policies. We need to create a welcoming environment. We need to implement gender neutral patient forms. We need to create staff training. And we need to take sexual histories. Policy implementation means developing and adopting non-discriminatory policies, uh, developing a potentially a, a patient advisory council to address any issues, identifying staff and physicians with experience who can serve as LGBT champions, creating a welcoming environment by prominently posting non-discriminatory policies, providing educational brochures, providing forms that are gender neutral, like this one. Staff training not only to address homophobia, but to address heterosexism. How well do you know this patient, I ask you. What if this patient presented to you as a new patient versus a new lesbian patient? How would you react, would you ask this person to the left if she was a lesbian, if she came into your clinic right away? How would you treat her if she introduced herself as a lesbian patient? Again, something for you to think about. How do you feel when you learn when you're hearing this? So, you know, when we assess a healthcare environment, we should be asking, do staff feel comfortable working with patients? Are there opportunities to discuss concerns? Are staff informed on current LGBT health needs? And we need to take sexual histories and normalize this. As the Institute of Medicine, uh, an Institute of Medicine report, report said in 1997, ironically, it may require greater intimacy to discuss sex than to engage in it. And that's quite true. So initiatives, um, the, health, the Human Rights Campaign has done a really good job at developing a healthcare equality index, which is a way of ranking healthcare facilities around the country around their LGBTQ abilities, right? And why? And this is why we're, they're doing this work. But they've ranked all of these, and they have scores for facilities in every state around the country. And they use this 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 um, metric here that looks at experiences of discrimination and what have you for assigning points with 100 being the best possible point. This is actually in the state of New Jersey, and as you can see, not all of them so ideal in terms of reading, reaching an ideal score. Some actually pretty bad. Um, so what healthcare challenges do LGBT people face today? So I would say that the crises of the past are very much the crises of the present. Today's generation is changing the norms of what it means to be an LGBTQ person while continuing to shoulder the burden of AIDS, stigma, and discrimination faced by its predecessors. And to this end, we are working with an organization right now called Garden State Equality in New Jersey to try on a problem, project called Map and Expand, where we're surveying and hopefully going to create a map of LGBTQ friendly providers in our state. Because I will tell you, you know what happens to people in New Jersey who are LGBTQ? Where do you think they go for care? New York. <laughs> New York and? Philadelphia. Philadelphia, exactly right. They don't stay within the state. And so we want to make it so that they actually stay within the state. 
and this is what the Map and Expand project is all about, to understand the attitudes and experience of healthcare providers in New Jersey, to describe the extent of LGBT affirming practices, and to create a map that will allow LGBT New Jersey and LGBT New Jersey and residents to locate LGBT affirming activities. That's a map, that's a thing. I'm gonna just conclude by saying that I just think that enhancing LGBT healthcare is just enhancing human rights. So if we think about it from a human rights perspective, we've got all these lovely people, the person who should be president but won't be president, et cetera, et cetera, uh, we will be able to move this forward. I leave you with some resources, including great resources from the Fenway Institute, additional resources from the American Medical Association in GLAMA, other LGBT resources from GLAD. Finally, I am incredibly proud to say, I know you guys have a certificate, but we have a whole concentration of <laughs> We have a whole concentration in LGBTQ in our MPH program. And we have 12 students this year, and it's uh, really, really incredible for us. So if you have any questions, comments, thoughts, and ideas, you can follow me on the Twitter or the Instagram or on the World Wide Web. Thank you very much for being so attentive. Do we have time for a, a question or two or three or 17 or 19? seek psychotherapy because for off, very often negotiating one's sexual identity or gender identity is emotionally challenging and there's an openness to therapy. Not conversion therapy, which we had a conversation about earlier, right? But, but therapy, yes. Again, context, context specific. What goes on in New York and Philadelphia is not necessarily what goes on in Montana. I will tell you from a person who comes from a traditional Greek family, therapy? No. <laughs> My mother was worried every time I went to therapy that I was talking about her. I told her I, told her I was. No, in fact, I was. So I think the answer is they probably are accessing it at higher rates. But just because of the stigma and the experience in, in everyday life. Sir. Hi. Um, so my name is Hector. I go to Hunter College and I work with Pride Health. And so I'm curious as to, with each generation of queer folk, like, language and discourse changes yes. and so so does the style of intervention and the implementation science behind yes. classic uh, interventions have to be tailored not just for youth like all these gen z and yes. the meme and the TikTok generation yes. but also like the expansion of their gender identity so yes. they are more they identify more as non-binary yes. gender fluid gender yes. queer so how do we take traditional um interventions targeted for youth that are LGB or even just trans focused yeah. and like implemented towards folks who are whose yeah. identities are just all so over. So a, a few answers to the question. Number one, I don't believe in like one 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 size fits all interventions. Mm -hmm. I think that's nonsense. Mm -hmm. Kind of like I don't believe in one that teachers should be teaching one way to all students, mm -hmm. right? Because not all students learn in the same way, right? Right. So we have tailored instruction and we have tailored intervention. That's answer number one. Number two, this is not an answer to your question, but I'm going to tell you this thing anyway. What was really interesting, I did a book talk at NYU a couple of weeks ago, and one of the people in the audience said, do you think it might be easier for LGBTQ youth to come out now because they're not being forced into boxes, they're being, they can be in a continuum? And I never thought about it that way before. So that's an interesting point. Um, number three, uh, I, I, you know, like you have to just evolve the interventions, right? It's like, you know, Traditional interventions from 30 years ago are not going to work anymore, right? Just like those like vinyl records probably won't work anymore, right? <laughs> and you just have to adapt and modernize them and like make sure that, you know, not only does like do these interventions address what I think is important, which is gender and sexual identity, but race, culture, power, and privilege, right? And I think that that often gets forgotten in the conversation, right? And so the young men who I talked to in the book that I call the queer generation, they had a language and a nuance and an understanding about those issues that my generation, so the young guys were very nuanced, right? A big, sophisticated understanding of all the intersections. My generation, the age generation, were like, oh yeah, I'm gay and Greek. I can do that much. And the Stonewall generation guys, they had no language about it whatsoever. 
So it's been really interesting to evolve. So I think the way you develop those interventions, as they do with any intervention they develop, you talk to the people who you're trying to intervene on. Mm -hmm. They tell you what they, they know what they need, mm -hmm. and they will tell you what they need, and work with them. And I think that's the kind of stuff you're probably doing at the Price Center anyway, right? Yeah, yeah. we work with a lot of you, and we get roasted all the time. <laughs> I mean, I mean, Kristen just finished a study on resilience. We've been studying resilience in older adults living with HIV. I've been talking about that too. And we have a model who tested, and she just finished doing like these amazing interviews about resilience in older adults living with HIV. We've learned things I had no idea about, what, about resilience that I thought were, like I never thought about. Mm -hmm. Because we talked to people who are resilient, right. and they told us. I hope that kind of answered yeah. your question. Yes. Back, back of the room. Hi. Hi. Wait, is this one? Oh. Um, so I kind of have two questions oh. from a healthcare access and policy perspective. Um, I'm very opposed to framing that issue with like, you know, it falls on these populations. To me, it's more like, who are we allowing to enter medical school, number one? And number two, what does that training look like? We know that there's no uniformity. And yes. if, what, it, what is the role essentially of these institutions and government, for example, like, hey, we're not granting, yes. you know, residency yes. money to your teaching hospital unless who you're graduating from your program is competent in providing care to these populations. Yes. But also, like, how is recruitment as well looking like in these medical schools for, you know, folks that identify with these vulnerable populations? So, so many, so many thoughts on that. <laughs> I'm going to start with this. I'm going to start with this thought. So one of the challenges I have in New Jersey right now is that the public health work, workforce doesn't look at the population of New Jersey, and so our schools working really diligently with the departments of health to provide opportunities for people who work in departments of health to get a public health education because I think the public health workforce needs to look at the, like the population number one. Number two, most medical schools, schools do a crappy, that's a scientific word, job, at training people around LGBTQ issues, because usually what happens is they get a four hour seminar, eight hour seminar, or something like that. Some schools, like Rutgers and NYU and others, are embedding LGBTQ issues throughout the curriculum. Very much like it's happening in social studies classes in New Jersey and California. New Jersey and California now require that LGBTQ history be taught in schools, my husband, being an eighth grade social studies teacher in New York City, doesn't have to teach it, but he does teach it. And I think when you embed the experiences of people throughout, so when you're talking about cardiovascular disease, and you talk about the experiences of African Americans, and of gay people, and of women, instead of like waiting to do a whole separate seminar on gay people, you're going to create a, a workforce, adopt a, a workforce of physicians that are much better prepared to deal with the population. That's not answer number two. And answer number two, I don't know who we're letting into medical school. <laughs> I have no idea, right? But I do know that when we create situations like it's the case at NYU where it's free, because you all know that tuition is free at NYU Medical School now, mm -hmm. pretty amazing, um, you're going to get people who are probably much more representative of the population than has been in the past. So that's my three answers to you. And it's not incumbent. You're absolutely right. It should be the, it should, like psychologists and nurses and social workers do a really good job with these issues, right? The medical profession is not as good, right? Um, I wonder if you could um, talk about the elevated mental health uh, situation for LGBTQ population. Does it proceed? Uh, coincide with their self-awareness, acceptance of their position, or does it happen? So, Perry Halkiris would say <laughs> that when you're five or six or seven years old and you're experiencing that this feeling of otherness that all of us experience for LGBTQ, when we're looking around and think, I'm, the, I'm what? what? I don't know what's going on with me, <laughs> which you then realize is that you're a gay person or a lesbian person later on in life. I think that that otherness if unchecked, right, and unsupport, and, and un, like if there's not support, leads to higher mental health issues. That's my answer number one. Answer number two, I think there's a biological basis for mental health issues too, that we can't like we can't like forget, right? And so that's answer number two. Answer number three, one of the studies we did, and I think Paul, you were on this paper, um, parents, LGBTQ parents, not surprising, who come from parents who have mental health issues, 
also have mental health issues. But the sexual orientation factor, the distress, the psychological distress, is often rooted in experiences of rejection and of otherness that one experiences because they're LGBT. And that mental health and those mental health issues often are another reason, often are factors that, that engender and lead to risk behaviors, which are lead to HIV and other STIs. So it creates this, you know, conglomerate, it, it's this, this constellation, this endemic, this conglomeration of a messy health issue that I don't need to face. Um, yeah. Um, just to piggyback off that a little bit, um, Please. Uh, one of the things that I, uh, uh, I think is really nice that you point out is sort of having this idea of overall well-being for LGBTQ people uh, rather than just focusing on HIV and one of the things I've um, constantly thought about, especially for racial and ethnic minorities, is happiness and uh, identity disclosure and how long uh, not being out um, and the impacts of that and how that is um, different based on different racial and ethnic. And I was wondering if you can just talk about that just a little bit. Yeah, so, so there's a pretty substantial body of work that shows that individuals who individuals who stay in the closet more who end up being bullies of the kids who are out by the Stan Keller's work and some other people's work, um, they have worse health, mental health outcomes, right? Um, so being closet longer, hiding one's identity longer, un not living one's truth longer is ultimately lifelong worse mental health outcomes than people who negotiated at an early age. Now, having said that, there might be a point where it's too young to negotiate that, right? So the question, and it's this fine line here, right? Like, what's the ideal? Is it seven or eight or nine? Is it 35? Like, those seem extreme. But maybe there's some place in adolescence that's the right answer. And I don't think we know what that is, but I can argue that too late is probably that, and too early is probably also not so great in terms of overall mental health. Because then that child is subjecting can him comes her themselves to bullying and victimization. I, I hear these stories all the time from my husband, who works on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, of like LGBTQ youth who are in eighth grade, who in Manhattan, Manhattan, right, getting victimized and bullied by the other students, right, and you know, and, and how he like, makes it his responsibility to care for them. So, but how many kids are in those situations who don't have a Bobby in their and as their teacher to protect them? A lot. So. I think, like in everything, like even with like disclosure of HIV status, there are some contexts where you know it's going to be safe, and some where it's not going to be safe. And we have to equip people with the skills to be able to decipher when those situations happen. Just one, two more questions. Sama and Alana, and then we'll wrap and carry on. Stick around for a while with us. I'm not going anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Ever. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. And um, one of the slides that you were talk a lot about more of the structural issues um, that often arise. Yeah. But if you could talk a little bit about when you start thinking about race ethnicity and the differences yeah. from different cultures, how that may vary, um, and how you tease apart that, like in terms of the cultural norms and the family structures, and um, just, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. I like, I, what I would say in response, but I mean, in relation to health or coming out or all of those things. Oh, oh. Yeah, so I look, I think it's I think that there's not a lockstep pattern for coming out and there's not a lockstep pattern for you know delivery of health care for people of different races and cultures. And I think that there so here's my here's my T V answer. I have a TV answer for you. But I love going back to TV. Which nobody watches here. Okay, but I do. So there's a second episode of Will Embrace the Reboot, right? Where there's a young character who's like in his twenties who's dating Will. And he's a young white guy, you know, who's played by the guy from the play Evan Hansen, right? And he is coming out to Will, and they're talking about their sexual identity negotiation, telling their parents, and Will, you know, being my age, is like, oh, it was a challenge, blah, blah, blah. And this young man says, oh, it's so hard for me, because my parents were divorced, and they both had coming out parties for me for, at the same time, right? <laughs> so that really angered me, that, and I actually wrote to the producers and the whole thing, <laughs> right? Because I have all that kind of time on my hands. 
parents, right? <laughs> so I did it anyway because I felt I needed to say that, that that portrayal is not a typical, that is not a typical characterization. And that for people who are from, you know, families that are rich in culture and tradition and that are often very patriarchal, right? Like mine was, I just happened to have the parents who did their job right, you know, it's much more complicated. And so I don't think you can take uh, Morales is a really good psychologist, a really famous psychologist, who writes about the negotiation of ethnic identity and sexual identity. And the idea that very often for what has to happen for those of us who are members of ethnic or racial groups is that we have to deny one identity to allow the other one to flourish. And that's very much what I did, right? I had to deny my Greekness for a long time in order to be a gay man. And then eventually I was able to negotiate that, fortunately for me. But I don't think you separate those issues. And I think that. This is why I don't believe in one-size interventions. How you help young black men negotiate their sexual identity when coming from a, a population that may be less accepted, right, of gay identity is going to be different from uh, white men. And that's why I think we have to like think about what different groups need. Um, yeah. So. So uh, uh, my question is about uh, one of the recent studies one of those fancy journals of nature science. One of those, the, the, the one about the genetics, how uh, they could do genetics to predict uh, uh, sexual orientation. Uh, yes, yeah. exactly. Right. And, do uh, I believe that? Is that what you're asking me? Uh, well, I'm, I'm asking. You know, I, I intuitively I don't like it because I don't like genetic explanation. Intuitively, I like it, but I wanted to hear your view. Here's why I think. Here's this is why I actually think there might. Look, I don't know. I don't know the answer. If there is truly a genetic. But if there's a genetic predisposition to hair color and athleticism and body type and skin tone, why would there might there not be a genetic predisposition to sexual orientation? And that's okay. I mean, you know, that, that just means that so in my family, all the men are like five seven, right? But I'm clearly not five seven. Right? And it's because genetically they could have been taller too, but it's the environment of like growing up in New York City with all this food that my mother kept feeding me, that allowed me to, and she fed me a lot, you know, that made me be this like tall guy, right? I think also, therefore, there may be, and you could disagree with me, all of you, there may be this genetic predisposition that the environment then helps to flourish. And in a healthy environment, a gay person with gay genes would be gay. Right? Yeah. I, 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 I am a good public health psychologist, but I really do believe in biological factors. Um, you know, at the end of the day, biological factors are really, really key, including for like psychopathology, right? You know, I don't believe that people should just go on antidepressants, right, to solve their problems. I think they should be in talk therapy. But you know what? Sometimes it really is about dopamine. Right? People become method addicts not because they, they not not because they have nothing better to do, but probably because there's some kind of nor faulty neurotransmitter action going on in their brains. And the dopamine that is being released by the methamphetamine is helping them regulate. Or they have undiagnosed ADHD, or they have undiagnosed depression levels. So yes, biology probably does have something to do with it. Definitely something at play here. Thank you so much. Oh thanks. Thank you. Thank you.